Hi, everybody. Uh, great to be with you talking to you today. Uh, my name is Gary Radburn. I'm the director of uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, virtualization and remoting here at Dell Technologies. Uh, we're finding ourselves in a very strange time in the world at the moment where we're trying to do more with less. We're trying to enable a workforce to work from home that we haven't uh, tried to do in huge numbers before. And we're now trying to look at new technologies about how can we actually enable our workers to be as efficient and productive as they were when they were in the office, even now that they're working remotely in their own homes. So what we're going to go through today is a few of the techniques and some of the technologies that we can actually use to accomplish this. Uh, and as we go through, I'll try and explain some of the technology behind it, where it's come from, and why it's useful in terms of video production, high-level graphics, and workstation-type scenarios. Uh, when we're trying to use uh, standard virtualization for VDI, for instance, for office applications, there's not really that higher graphics component or some of the accuracy that's really needed for video editing. So these techniques and these solutions will actually enable you to A, do more with less. So having the equipment that you may already have and how do you maximize the use of that in the situation we find ourselves in? And also how do we uh, remote in for high powered graphics users and still maintain their productivity try and minimize the latency, but still give them that near workstation experience, even though they're, they're not co-located with data. So let's move on. So the agenda, I'm going to go through how did we actually get here with the workstation evolution? How have CPUs progressed to a point now where we really have a lot of capacity which might be going wasted and not being utilized fully? And how can we actually use that inside of um, where we are now? So what are we trying to solve? There's going to be some key things inside of that. Working from home actually has a lot more inherent challenges than just how do I have a workstation in my home um, where you know there could be insurance implications, you've got family, pets, things like that running around, and then you've got high-powered, high-cost equipment inside of your home. So how can we mitigate some of those other risks that we have inside of home working? Then how do we actually accomplish this? How do we actually get people working from home? So that's the shifting pixel side. And then we'll move on into how can I now take that technology and allow multiple workstation users to be on a single workstation, for instance. So a single workstation back in the data center, but still having multiple users access it at any given time. And then moving from just a few users to how can I really maximize the number of users on that workstation and still keep them all productive? And then, of course, right at the very end, the big reveal about how do we actually accomplish this and what technology do we use to actually do this? So the first thing I'd like to say is we've had a huge advance in the number of cores that are available on a single CPU. Uh, back in the old days, you know, it was a single core, then it went to dual core, quad core, and now we're really racing ahead now. And there seems to be this insatiable desire to have more and more cores on a single CPU die. So inside the workstation space, especially things we have dual socket machines as well, you could actually have, you know, 56 cores and, you know, 112 with hyperthreading uh, inside a single workstation box. Now, the challenge that we actually have in many applications across the board is that most applications become single threaded. Uh, they've grown up over time. They've been monolithic. Uh, and we need to maximize the use of our machines inside of that, because if we've only got one application running and it's a single threaded app, we've got a lot of cores that are sitting there that aren't being utilized and just going to waste. So we will see a technique of how we can actually use all of those cores inside of it. The other thing I would say as well is like when we're talking about media entertainment and um, video production, et cetera, there's a lot of rendering that goes on inside of the system as well. Uh, rendering tends to be more multi-threading. So is there a way perhaps that we could easily migrate from one system to another system at different times of the day? So if our workforce is working nine to five, let's say, yeah, we wish, but yeah, nine to five, let's just take as a norm, 
then after that time, the workstation is now completely idle. What would happen if we could actually repurpose that workstation very easily overnight to form part of a render cluster? So we're now maximizing our resources for 24-hour operation inside of a system that's actually validated to work for 24 hours and maximizing our use of our resources, even though we're all in disparate locations. So we'll be seeing how to solve that one. But what are the real challenges we're trying to solve? So we're trying to get people working remotely. That's on the left-hand side. Uh, getting them working remotely, but getting them working securely and remotely. Uh, the last thing you want to do is have users taking all of your data home. Now, with Office applications, as I've said, it's very easy just to shift the pixels across the network and then have your email on the server somewhere that doesn't come down locally to the machine. If somebody's actually working on their next video production, uh, very large files, do you want them actually copying it over the network, which is laborious, takes a long time because of the amount of data that's coming across? Do you want to ship them out a hard drive or a USB key that actually has all the information on it so they can use that? And then you start to lose control of your data because what happens if that gets lost in the post, gets lost in the car park or whatever else, you could have your IP actually compromised very, very easily. So if we can actually offer people the ability to be able to work from home, but to actually locate the actual compute resource and the data inside of the data center itself, which is the most secure location inside of your organization, uh, if it's not the most secure location, then there's a different discussion we can have. Uh, but if you've got the data co-located with the workstation remotely inside of the data center, and now your local user's PC at home just becomes that window into that workstation world, we're now not transmitting any data anywhere. And obviously, if you're using extremely large data sets, as you would be with video files, then to co-locate the computing resource with those video files makes a lot more sense as well. So we're actually solving another problem, even though the major one we're trying to do is the work from home and enabling workstation users, we're actually giving performance improvements for that working from home and securing the data all in the same type of solution. The other thing about centralization is it makes it easier for uh, IT managers to manage uh, individual resources. They're inside of the data center. They can remote into those. They can access those machines. They can update them. They can patch them. They don't have to go to each user's house to actually patch a PC or a workstation. Uh, if something goes wrong with the hardware, they don't have to go to somebody's house to go and fix that workstation uh, with the social sorry, the social distancing that we're currently having to practice. So if everything is actually in a data center, it makes it a lot easier for an IT manager to manage all those assets, to fix those assets, and patch those assets. The other thing that we have is you can enable collaboration. So now everything is centralized. We can actually have users worldwide accessing those resources as if they were local. So we can have everybody accessing that data. Uh, now we're having things like the... Um, we're having the resources being worldwide, the gig economy, uh, as it's called, uh, where we could actually get the best people worldwide all working on the same assets that are in a central location. So now everybody doesn't have to be in the same building, uh, not really allowed to at this current moment in time, uh, but you're not in the same building, but you can still collaborate effectively. And it now really gives you a worldwide platform for getting the best resources worldwide to work on a particular project in a secure fashion. So how does this actually work? So this is how we actually shift those pixels. Um, we've got a very good partnership and have done for a number of years uh, with a company called Teradici. Uh, they actually manufacture a hardware card, which can go into the host system inside of the data center. And what it is, is actual hardware based, doesn't interfere with the host whatsoever. So all of your CPU cycles are being used for the programs you want to run rather than being used for the compression of the data, the security of the data across the network. But what we can do here is you plug the hardware card into the GPU direct. So that direct connection now takes the output of the GPU, puts it into what we call the host card, it compresses it, sends it across the LAN or the WAN, and then we decompress it at the other end. So all we're doing is shipping pixels to the end user. 
all of your data is staying local in the data center. All of your compute resource is in the data center. You're just using what could be a zero client device, uh, which is what we have as the, in the 5030. So that's a hardware decompression right, of that data going across. So again, very, very efficient. Or we can use a software client. So there's a, a software client that you can run on any PC to decode that data if you don't have, happen to have a zero client available. You can do multi-monitor on it. There are some limitations with the solutions, uh, one of which is the fact that you've got a 2560 by 1600 resolution maximum uh, single monitor, or I can actually have a dual display. Uh, so I could have uh, dual displays of 1920 by uh, 1080 uh, on uh, that card, or if I have, actually have the quad host card, which allows us to do uh, four monitors or two 2560 by 1600. So we can still be very, very efficient inside of our use of our resources, whether we have a dual host card or a quad host card, depending on what our end client requirements are. Now, we can look at that and say, okay, there's a limitation there on the resolution, the highest resolution, because a lot of customers now are working at 4K resolution. So how do we uh, actually move on from there? But one of the best uh, things about the host card is that should the PC or workstation lock up, uh, and it's remote, then you'd normally have to log a support call for somebody to actually go into the data center to actually reboot that PC physically, and then it would come back up, and then you can log back into it again. If you have a software lockup, that's generally a bad thing if you're trying to remote in. The advantage of a host card solution is because it's hardware-based and because all of our precision workstations actually have the remote power connector on it, you can remotely power on, power off, and reboot your workstation, even if the OS has hung. Right? So that gives you a distinct advantage of uh, having a software-based solution, but you are then perhaps constrained, depending on your workflow inside of your video production, whether the resolution is high enough for what you actually need. So there's also a software solution which doesn't have that hardware component of the reboot that I just mentioned. Uh, but does now allow you to do 4K resolutions. And so you can now have multiple monitors running at 4K. Uh, the hardware-based solution, so the hardware zero clients, still have the same limitation of their resolution because it's all based inside of firmware. They can't deal with that 4K resolution. Uh, but you can interface it with a software host, which is the point of this slide. So you can still do hardware to hardware, hardware to software, software to hardware, software to software in terms of all those different connectivities. But a software solution is going to give you that 4K resolution. If you've got a client that supports that 4K and has AVX2 extensions inside of the CPU, uh, that's one of the caveats, it can then decode that 4K stream and then connect to a 4K monitor to give you that near workstation experience working on a 4K workload at home. The great thing about PC over IP as well, is, which is the, um, the transport for it, is that it uses different codecs depending on what's on the screen, whether it's graphical or textual. So it makes the most efficient use possible of the bandwidth on your network. And it also has a build to lossless option. So over a couple of frames, if you need absolute accuracy rather than just visually lossless, visually lossless means I can't tell that there's any pixels that have changed. But if you're looking at color space and things like that, sometimes you can't detect that. So visually lossless is one side, but build to lossless will actually build to a completely lossless screen to mimic what you would have had if you had a local connection to it. And PC over IP allows you to do that level of um, lossless support. Now, let's kick it up a notch. When we start to go, okay, you mentioned all of those calls, Gary, at the start. Where I've got a lot of calls in some workstation. My applications might not be making most efficient use of it. How can I actually use those more effectively? Well, virtualization is, a, is another hat I wear inside of this. And now that GPUs have really become of age and have a lot of power, even on a single wide card, you could take something like our uh, Rack 7920 2U workstation, rack mount that inside of the data center. You can put four GPUs inside of it. So let's say, for instance, RTX 4000s. Uh, so nice, powerful card, single wide inside of that. And then I could create a virtual machine 
for each user inside of the, uh, the rack workstation. I can dedicate a number of CPU cores to each user, and I can then pass through that GPU into that virtual machine. That means every user will have dedicated number of CPU cores and will also have a dedicated GPU that they have all to themselves. So this will enable a, uh, a very good workflow for four different users on a single 2U workstation, each of which has dedicated resources with no slowdown, no perception of uh, difference to a local machine inside of it. And you can get very, very effective use of your resource there. So by now virtualizing, having those four GPUs, I've now got four users running out of one workstation. So by utilizing the number of cores in my CPU and spreading those out, it becomes very, very good use of that resource that you may already have inside of your data center. To take it to the next level, then what happens if I want a lot of density? So I want to extend the reach of my workstations. Uh, there were users perhaps in the office who would borrow somebody else's workstation, uh, somebody who's signing off on drawings or videos or um, particular um, dailies or whatever else inside of there. And they didn't need the workstation full time. However, they'd go and borrow Bob or Sarah's workstation just so that they could actually do sign off and then go away and do the rest of their work during the day. Being at home now, you don't have that luxury of resource sharing with other people. So perhaps you actually want to give somebody the power of a workstation on an occasional basis, or you want to consolidate down when uh, there's a team that's working and perhaps they're doing light level uh, GPU work, and then you can split a single GPU over multiples of users. So with NVIDIA's uh, RTX 6000 and RTX 8000 cards um, that have come out, the Quadro cards, you can now use virtualization of the GPU, so the vGPU uh, stack inside of there, and split that graphics card out to 24 or 48 users as a theoretical maximum. Uh, normally, you'd probably only split it between four and eight, depending on the workload that you're actually doing. But you could put three grid cards or the RTX 6000, 8000 cards inside of the Rack 7920. This is going to give you some great consolidation numbers, enabling people to use a workstation on an occasional basis uh, or using it on a permanent basis and dedicate the entire card to them or just put fewer users on that one card. So you've got a very powerful card. Not everybody is going to be thrashing the CPU at the same time. So it works in pretty much the same way that CPU virtualization has done over the years and is now doing it in the video format. So now we can get all of those same connections. We can use the software stack um, from Teradici, the, um, the client access software uh, that they call it there. And you can load that onto each virtual machine, and you can then have the equivalent of all of these VMs going out to a lot of different users, all sharing the resources inside of there. Now, I mentioned earlier about reappropriating and converting it to a render farm or whatever else. Now, imagine we've got this scenario of these virtual machines during the day. What I could then do is simply through my virtual management platform, I could then change the virtual machine that boots up into that particular system uh, overnight and make that into a node in a render farm. So if I then booted it up into even Linux, so people using Windows during the day perhaps, then you boot it up to a, a Linux image that has a Linux render farm for overnight use, and then in the morning reset it back so users can then log back in and do their daily work. So now I've got maximum flexibility of my resources inside of there as well to enable not only the users to be flexible, but the hardware to be flexible as well in terms of its use methodology. So just a quick look at the architecture. I'm not going to delve into this too much. Uh, but what you do is you run a virtualization layer on top of your hardware. So in this case, at Dell Technologies, we use VMware. Uh, so that runs ESXi as the hypervisor on there. The vCenter management layer then runs on top of that. And then your VMs run on top of vCenter or are managed by vCenter. Uh, so that allows you to control all of that infrastructure. And then underneath, inside of the hardware, because you're abstracting the hardware layer using the hypervisor, we've got our RTX GPUs inside of there, whether that be the pass-through ones or the vGPU 
uh, RTX cards. Uh, we were sharing our memory in between our virtual machines, our network interface cards, uh, the CPUs and the storage. And then we're sharing all of that out in a very, very efficient way with uh, near metal performance, near bare metal performance inside of that to share it across multiple users. So this is a great solution. We, we haven't done this as an out of the box. You can't just go and buy one item. It's got all of this uh, pre-installed. This is just ideas that I'm trying to give the community at large to do things more efficiently in the, the troubling times we're in. Uh, the Teradici cards are obviously, you know, we, um, we partner with them very heavily, as I said, and they're available inside of our systems as standard. When we get to the virtualization layer, then that becomes more of a uh, solution type focus where it can be built. And certainly, if you want to have more conversations about it, then I'm more than happy to field questions or for you to drop me a line and we can actually talk more in depth about it and try and work out what you really need uh, inside of your solution to make your company more effective and to be able to be better uh, positioned to have multiple users, managed users, still working on workstation graphics, workstation style performance, but working remotely at home. And if you're already using VMware, then you can actually leverage that infrastructure that you've already had and that management layer to bring to life what I've just gone through here. And so with that, I'll wrap up. Thank you very much for listening. It's been a, a pleasure to uh, have this time with you. And uh, please be safe. Take care.